data for specific for the specific for AI applications and mitigate the risk of bias or errors in the outcome. Uh, when it comes to uh, interest or services uh, offered, we can observe two trends. AI and aware companies are much more interested in basic services, such as coaching, training, and direct support with data uh, acquisition, processing, and analysis. While AI aware companies uh, expect larger benefits from higher level services, such as guidelines, checklists, quality assurance, uh, legal, ethical, and trustworthiness services, uh, underlying that they feel confident in creating their uh, AI solutions, but they still need support for some more specialized services. Then uh, a significant majority of AI aware companies expressed uh, the need to access guidelines and checklists to assess uh, and document trust, uh, the trustworthiness of their AI solution. Uh, and this indicates a growing recognition of the importance of ensuring trustworthy AI systems. Uh, companies are seeking structured frameworks and tools that can assist them in evaluating uh, and uh, documenting the ethical, legal, and technical aspects of their AI application. Loredana, you have a minute to finish up, please. Thank you. Okay, thank you so much. Uh, then I wanted to go to the technical tools. Uh, I will, um, yes, I will just show this last slide with the more broader uh, insight into the technical tools that the companies would like to have access to. And the analysis um, um, shows that a significant percentage of the survey companies expressed a strong desire to have access to tools that can assist them in complying with AI regulations. Uh, it demonstrates the recognition of the importance of adhering to uh, legal uh, and regulatory frameworks surrounding AI. Um, also, uh, companies express a, a strong interest in having access to AI libraries that can support them in developing uh, AI models. Uh, so this uh, underlines the importance of having robust and comprehensive libraries that can provide a, a range, a largely range of algorithms, frameworks, and resources for AI uh, model development. Okay, I will stop here then. Uh, these are a few things that can uh, help us start the discussion for today. But uh, like I mentioned, if you want to uh, have access to the entire um, uh, needs analysis, it is available on uh, on the website. Thank you, Loredana. And we have our uh, second presenter, uh, Martin Tamaikar from Kinich here with us. And uh, we, from what we learn from the SME, and it is not just solely about what they need, uh, but also I believe that there's a number of other um, AI researchers and innovators would also be uh, wanted to access to AI libraries and then uh, all also kind of different AI models. They also need the data clear, uh, cleaning tools and other needs that uh, Loredana already mentioned. So now uh, let's see what Martin can uh, bring us uh, through. Martin, take it away. Thank you. Thank you very much. Um, just to confirm, can you hear me? Yes. Good. So first of all, I'm very glad that I can be here today with you to introduce you the platform and also to provide you some examples how different services can be built on top of the platform and how different services can benefit from the platform itself. So today's outline is going to be kind of full. In the first part, I'm going to provide an introduction of the AI on demand itself. Some of you probably probably already heard some part of, parts of it, but I believe it's, it's necessary to go through the introduction of the AI on demand platform before cross proceeding. In the second part, we are going to look at the platform from a slightly different view. We are going to look at it from the perspective of a service or rather a service developer that would like to develop a service that benefits from the platform. So we are going a little bit more into technicalities, which we are going to finish in the third part of the presentation, where we are going to look at one particular service, Rail, Research and Innovation AI Lab, that is already being developed on top of the AI on demand platform. Here, we are going to go even more into technical details, 
but I believe it will be useful for you if you are about to connect to the platform. So let's begin with the first part. So the, the journey of the on-demand platform began in 2018 with a project called AI for EU. Uh, you probably, all of you, know the project. And the two main outputs of the project were the Drupal, a portal, a catalog of different AI assets, and things like AI events and educational resources. So basically a content management system that contains all of these. And the second output was an experimentation platform or experimentation system called AI for Experiment. It's based on Acomos or Eclipse Graphene. And right now it has been rebranded to AI Builder and it is developed further within the AI for Europe project. So these are the two main outputs of the AI for EU project, the predecessor of AI for Europe. But what happens is that in between the requirements changed. Uh, the requirements changed from just creating a catalog of a catalog of different AI resources like models, data sets, papers, and so on, to build a platform that others can integrate with. And, and the, the main requirement today is to build a platform that will help AI researchers and also AI practitioners from the industry, from SMEs and other industry other industry sizes to build a platform that they can use in many, many different ways. Some people will want to use the platform as a real platform and build on top of it some services. And some other people may maybe use the platform as one-stop shop to obtain different kinds of AI assets, data sets, models, and so on. So what came was the AI for Europe project, which started in 2022. And then uh, this project is the one that builds the foundations of the AI on demand platform. Actually, last year in 2023, we had the first release of the new AI on demand platform. It's also important to note that this platform targets mostly the researchers, different types of researchers, both from academia and industry, and also different types of European projects and networks of excellence uh, AI associations and so on. So all these stakeholders are expected to benefit from the platform, which is not an easy task, but it can bring huge value if it is done properly. Because it means that if the platform succeeds, which we believe and which we are sure it will, both academic researchers, industrial researchers, and also the practitioners will benefit from each other, which is kind of strong. And, and uh, yeah, this can help us as Europe a lot. So the requirements changed, and therefore we created in, within the AI for Europe project a new concept. Instead of having just a metadata catalog, we want to provide a platform and a seed of services. And we want to provide the platform and let the community to build on it, and then the community to benefit from each other. So in other words, we just want to provide useful tools and useful platform that others can build on. So this is the main, main philosophy of the AI on platform. And the question is, I, I mentioned that we want to provide the tools, but what are actually the tools and what are the things that the people need to, to do things and research and development in, with AI? And we identified, first of all, three different types of uh, things. The first one is that if you are doing AI, of course, you need data. And most likely, you need some kind of big data. Like, for instance, imagine that you are developing or fine-tuning some large language model or any other generative model. You need quite a huge quantity of data. And getting data is not a problem in general. For some domains, it is. But get, getting high-quality data, reliable data, it is a problem. Then what the platform aims to address is to provide also big iron or some huge computational capacity. Why? Because again, AI is a powerful tool, but it also requires powerful hardware to, to be trained on and to be also inferred on. And last but not, but not least, if different stakeholders are to provide their resources either for free or against pay, payment, it's often 
crucial to ensure that these resources will be only provided to those people that the provider select. And this brings us to the need of having a reliable identity provider. So given that the platform provides these three things besides many others, there are two different types of users that can benefit from the platform. The consumers that can consume all the AI assets, all the services that will be available in the platform, and also the prosumers or producers of services can benefit from the platform. If nothing else, they can use, for instance, platforms API, and I will go to that later, to build their services in an easier way. Or they can even provide their services directly through the platform and potentially get to larger audience. So this is a big picture of the platform and how does it actually look like right now and what is the philosophy and what is the architecture of the platform? So first of all, the new and demand platform is aimed to be decentralized, which means that there will not be one central point, for instance, here or here, that will represent the platform. It will not be just a bunch of servers in one place. The platform aim, aims to be decentralized and synchronized which means that there will be potentially many different deployments of the platform, one at the university in Spain, another one at the university in Slovakia, another one at some SME in Germany, for instance. And these nodes are aimed to collaborate together, to share the metadata, to share the resources. But what such an architecture provides to those who actually deploy them on their own is full control over the node itself. So let's imagine that you have huge computational resources that you would like to share with others, maybe against payment. And what it means that you can deploy the platform, you can plug in your computational resources or maybe data sources to your node, and you can decide which parts of the resources you will use through your node or the platform and which parts will be shared with the others. So it gives you, compared to some centralized approach higher flexibility against higher complexity but that's the price okay and what it actually what, what the platform actually contains it's a bunch of websites as you will see in a while it's a bunch of applications that will be built on top of the platform ai services also programming interfaces because the platform aims to be used as a foundation for other services to build on top of so we are providing programming interfaces of different types. And also what we aim to provide is some advanced functionalities like search engines and chatbots in order to find and benefit the most from the huge amount of metadata that is contained in the platform already. So to provide a different view, the users usually use some services. It can be just imagine some web application, some web service. These services that are built on top of the platform will be included or will be presented in the AI on demand website, which is the entry point to the platform itself, which should be directly to the service that you need. If you need to program with AI resources, then it should redirect you to the right, to the right service. If you need to find a event, for instance, where there will be some nice presentation about generative AI, you should be redirected to the service that brings you to the event. So this is the main philosophy, that there is one central point, or one, we call it a marketing portal, that presents you the other services that are built on top of the platform. And these services provide you access to all of the stuff that I already mentioned, to data, authentication and authorization mechanisms, physical resources, it has the computational infrastructure and also different AI tools. And how is it done? How actually these services can uh, access these different types of resources? It is through the platform and through the platform interfaces. Right now, there are two main platform interfaces. One of them is a REST API documented through an open API protocol. And the other one is SDK. Currently, there is being developed a Python SDK that communicates directly with the API of the platform. 
And it's important to note that some of these features are, of course, not already implemented, but will be implemented in next releases. And when we are talking about releases, we the development lifecycle of the platform is based on releases. So in the first release, 0 0.1, we mostly dedicated the time to maintenance of current systems that I already mentioned, the Drupal system and also the Eclipse Graphene or Air for experiments. Recently, we had the first release. And in this first release, quite a lot of functionality was actually released in a first release version, which included, for instance, metadata catalog, which is accessible through the REST API. Also, the first version of the SDK for some convenient access to the metadata catalog and other services. And of course, there are other releases that are going to be released. The, the, the second one is going to be released quite soon. I frankly do not remember the, the date right now, but what is going to be there? Connectors to other platforms. So for instance, right now, the, the metadata catalog provides access to data sets and AI resources from, if I'm not wrong, three different platforms. Hugging Face, Zenodo, and OpenML. Of course, there are other resources like educational resources from, from the IDA platform and others. And we want to extend this uh, amount of metadata from many different resources available through one point through the platform to more resources. Yeah. Uh, and before we go to the second section of the presentation, I'm just going to very quickly go through a couple of services that are already built. The first one is the portal or the marketing portal. It's the entry point to the platform that aims to introduce you to the platform and to redirect you to other services built on top of that. So this is the entry point. Right now, it's focused, as I said, on marketing and promotion of systems and services. And based on user feedback, this, the UX of this entry point is to be enhanced in the nearest future. The second one is so-called My Library or Marketplace. My Library aims to allow you to browse different types of resources. Right now, in this version, you have access to AI models, datasets, experiments, and services available in the platform or rather to the metadata that are available in the platform. And you can search in these assets. You can open the, open the details of these assets, which are here. And of course, you can also add the assets to your library, which can then be used by other services. So you can, let's call it now, buy, although you do not pay, you just add it to your library, different data sets. And they will be accessible as your data sets in other services. Oh, excuse me. So this was the second one. The third one is that the AMDM platform provides an authentication authorization service, which is currently the EGI check-in. It's based on Keycloak and it's a federated one, which means that you are able to login through many different providers. In the short demo that I will that I will show you uh, in a while, you are, for instance, able to log in through your Google account. And there are many different providers available. And last but not least, there is a service called Rail. And I will talk more, more about Rail later in the presentation. So this was the first and very brief introduction of the AI-on-demand platform, its philosophy, and what components it actually is composed from. And right now, I'm going to focus again on the platform, but from a perspective of a service. So if you are about to build a service and you want to benefit from the platform, the entry point for you is actually the AI-on-demand REST API and its SDK, currently the Python SDK. This provides the access to different services. This is the first one. It provides you the access to a very rich metadata catalog of data sets, AI assets, and other different stuff. 
It provides you the access to computational infrastructure through some, something called Rihanna, which I'm going to talk about later about. And also, it's important to know that in this metadata catalog, not the data themselves are stored. The on-demand platform aims to provide you unified access to the metadata about different data, different types of AI assets on different platforms, at least for now. So already what is available in the platform are metadata from not only these, but also other different platforms. And what the service can do with the platform is that it can basically use its REST API. It can get different resources from there. It can push resources. It can also execute some code in the platform. And the real demo will be the whole about execution. And it can use the authentication and authorization mechanism. So just to show you some example, if I want to get, for instance, data sets from the platform, in code, it can look something like this. It's not a black magic, and I'm showing you this because I want to show you that it's not difficult to use the platform. You just use normal code, nothing too fancy. And here you have three examples of using the platform in three different languages. And the result, again, is standard. It's JSON. It's nothing fancy. It's nothing proprietary. It's JSON. So if you want to download, for instance, or search in the data sets by name or by keywords, you will get the results about metadata of different data sets as a form of a JSON array. So it's kind of easy to use. And what happens under the hood? So I, as a service, want to get a list of data sets with some pagination, probably. What happens is that I call this endpoint of the platform, and then the platform itself collects the data about different data sets for me. And here is the strength of the platform. It can be from the metadata store, of course, but it can also come from different services. There is no reason why this data set, but the, the list of the data sets couldn't be provided by a service. And potentially, this can be provided by a service that is already built on top of the platform. So for instance, some SME makes its living from providing a very specialized types of medical data sets. And if they decide that they want to provide the access to the data sets through the platform, there is no reason why they couldn't do it in such a way. And the, the benefit for, for the service is that it gets the information, the metadata about data sets from many different sources in a unified way. So this was how one service can benefit from the platform. Now, the, the services can also benefit from each other when using the platform. So let's have a look at one example. Let's have one service X that, for instance, belongs to a company that collects the fact checks. So they have some employees who make the fact checks of these informative, for instance, Facebook posts or, or something like that. So they have a huge database of these. And this one, the service Y, wants, is, for instance, a discussion forum that wants to moderate the discussion and that wants to provide the links to fact checks if there is some disinformation claim in the forum. So what can happen is that the service X pushes the fact checks metadata every night to the platform. And then they are stored in the metadata catalog and the service Y, the consumer, can pull the fact checks every day and use them through the platform. It's important to note that only the metadata are available in the platform. The data themselves are available in the service. So this was one example. Let's extend. What if we had two different services that produce fact checks, one on daily basis, one on weekly basis, and probably also in different forms because the database of this service is completely different from the database of this service. What the service buy can do, they can still consume the fact checks from the platform and nothing too much changes actually for this consumer because the platform takes care of unification of data sources from many different sources. So this is another example how different services can benefit from each other through the platform. And there are many others. And now 
let's look at the third part of the presentation and at what one particular service that is already built and being built on top of the platform, Rail. So what is Rail? A simple, simply said, Rail is a tool that focuses on AI practitioners, for instance, researchers, PhD students, but also people from industry. And Rail wants to allow you to explore AI assets that are available in the platform and use them. So combine somehow the AI assets, for instance, data sets and models, and execute some code on top of them in a lightweight and flexible way. This is Rail. To be more extensive and more concrete, Rail is a web application which is composed of backend and frontend, and you will see it later, that enables AI practitioners to work with AI on demand assets. So you can explore, search, compare, but not only. You can also create experiments that are reproducible, also for you and for others, and you can execute them directly in the AI on demand platform, on the platform and on the hardware and infrastructure provided by the platform. Yeah, and if, for instance, you made an inference, so you selected some model available in the platform and the data set available in the platform, and you made, for instance, an inference and the result is some data processed by the model, then you can also download the results of the experiments. So what's under the hood of Rail? Rail, as I said, is a front-end backend application. The front end is coded in a standardly used technology Angular, and the back end is, co is coded also in a standardly used technology Fast API and MongoDB. Then the back end communicates with the REST API of the AI on platform. So it accesses resources, models, and datasets mostly, reads, searches, and so on. And also it uses the AI on demand platform authentication and authorization mechanism. Martin, you have five more minutes for the presentation, please. Thank you. Yeah, thank you. But this is not it. Rail also enables you to execute stuff through Rihanna, which is also the part of the end demand. So you can combine models, data sets, and execute. I will have a demo soon. And also what we want to provide is Rail SDK. It's currently under development. So we will be able to, for instance, execute experiments through Rail uh, directly from your Jupyter notebook or from your Python script so that you do not need to use the front end if you are used to code, for instance. Now, let's have a look at one demo example and one illustration. So let's suppose that we have Kate, who is a CTO of a small startup. And this startup develops a model for sentiment analysis for sen or sentiment classification. So they already have the model that was trained on their data. And what they want to do is to evaluate the model on different situations, it is on different data sets, so that they can estimate how the model will, per will perform in the wild. Uh, yeah, so it means that they basically want to take the model and execute exactly the same or more or less the same code on many different data sets. It can be, of course, done in Jupyter Notebook. It can be done in Python script. But it can be done also in a different way. So this is reusable code, environment, and runtime. And the thing is that the data sets, also for sentiment analysis, are available in the platform, or rather the metadata. So what can be done through Rail is that Kate selects the model, Kate selects the data sets, and Kate executes the same code on the combinations of these. And then she gets the results. And she can compare the performance of the model on different data sets. There are two different scenarios in Rail which can happen. First scenario is the lucky one that somebody already coded so-called experiments, so executable reusable piece of code and, and stuff, and Kate just selects her data set, her model, and executes it and collects the results. If Kate is not lucky, she can implement her own sentiment evaluation experiment, use it, and potentially also share it with others. So let's have a look how it looks in Rail. 
Rail has three main components, and I will go very quickly through them. First is so-called experiment template. So the experiment template is a combination of execution environment. In this case, it's a Docker image. Software dependencies. Right now, we are supporting Python, so it's requirements text, Python libraries, and code that is being executed. So when one creates an experiment template in Rail, under the hood, what happens is that a Docker image is built. All the software dependencies are installed that are defined by Kate. And also, the code is packed in the, in the Docker image. And then when the image is executed, actually the code is executed. But there is already a guarantee that the software dependencies are there. And now let's have a look at the demo. So first of all, as I mentioned, you need to log in through the EGI check-in. And probably you could have seen that there are quite some identity providers. I just used the, the Google because it's the most convenient for me. And now I'm, I'm creating an experiment template. So I provide some descriptions, some metadata. So that's the boring stuff. But then I select the execution environment. As you could have seen, I selected the Docker image. I provided the libraries that are going to be installed inside. And now I provide the code that will be executed as a part of the experiment. I just copied it from my clipboard, but I provided the code. I also can provide environment variables, which give your experiment template flexibility to be adjusted. So for instance, I provided environment variable called split. And this environment variable is used in my code, so I have full control. Uh, to define which split of the hugging face data sets should be used. So I can use strand split, while other people can use a different split. And this is how an experiment template is created, and it also needs to be approved. After it's approved, I just did it in a different screen. It needs to be built, and this takes several minutes. So once we have this experiment template, we need to know that it's not executable. We just defined a template. But what we need to define now is that we have an experiment template that can do sentiment classification. But we need to define which model should it use, which data set, and also which split and column defined by the environment variables. So we create an experiment from this template. And this experiment contains already the information about the particularities uh, model, data set, environment variable. And these guys, or at least some of them, are taken from the AI metadata catalog. OK, so what happens is that I create an experiment. I will maybe need one or two more minutes long. Sorry for that. So I create an experiment. And this experiment is derived from the experiment template, as you can see here. So I know that it's an experiment for sentiment classification. Then I select particular model, data set, and provide the necessary information. It's submitted, and that's more or less it. That's the experiment. Because under the hood, the experiment is just recorded in the Mongo database that contains information about all the ingredients that should be executed. So we already know what code should be executed, in what Docker image, what are the dependencies, and what model should be used, and so on. And now is the time to execute. So what we actually do is that we just, I, I will not, not go into details how it is implemented, but we just take the experiment, the MongoDB record, we transform it to something, CWL, Common Workflow Language Manifest, and we send it to the AI on Demand Rihanna engine. And then it's executed, completely transparent, transparently for the user, it's executed. After it, ex after it is executed, I can collect the results, I can collect the log files, I can see basically the results of my experiment. And this is the last demo. So I went back 
to the experiment that I created a couple of seconds ago, and I run it. After I, after I run it, I can see so-called experiment run. When I go to the detail, I can see it's created and not much more. And this is what can be seen in Rihanna. You will not have access to that because it's an uh, internal thing. But you can see that all the information that I created, the Python script that I provided, and other stuff are available to Rihanna. So it's a workflow execution engine that executes my code on the on-demand infrastructure. And now the code was executed. It took some time. And by accident, it crashed two times. But Rail has inbuilt functionality to retry two more times. And the third one was successful. So after I visit the successful run, I can see that I can see the logs from my experiment. It's nothing more like prints from my Python script. And I can also download the results of the experiment. It is nothing more than the files that were saved by my Python script that I provided. And you can see that the results are basically the result of sentiment classification, a CSV file. So this was a highly technical demo with many details. And the purpose of this was not to remember all the details, definitely not. The purpose was just to show you what can be built on top of the AI demand platform. And Rail is only one of the services. It's an important service, but it's only one of them. And you are able to build many more services in a similar way. So maybe I will, for shortness of time, skip these slides and leave more time for discussion. Thank you very much. Thank you, Martin. And um, everyone, we have around 10 minutes for question and answers. Either you can type the question, or if you want, I can uh, let you speak to the speaker here. So we have uh, Loredana is still here with us. We have Martin, of course, with the very um, kind of detailed presentation. Uh, I hope that you, of course, you don't have to digest all the information right away. Uh, with this, I'm going to follow up with you by sending you a um, recording and also a feedback form um, in the emails that I follow up with you shortly, hopefully today or tomorrow, to, for you to really feed back to us to see that what we can do and how we can engage you in this. So, um, as I said, the um, the presentation are not going to be shared, but the recording that is already included with the presentation. I just wanted to save your I uh, mailbox from uh, too much information and too much uh, data that you included in. Uh, that's for Patrick. Thank you. Anyone have any questions? You can raise your hand, please. In the meantime, I have a question for Loredana. Uh, could you please unmute yourself? So what you already presented to us on the assessment and the needs of the um, SME. Uh, what are the strategy being considered to encourage more SME to adopt the AI on-demand platform the, the, for their AI initiative? Uh, yes, uh, in, at the moment we are taking a step-by-step -step approach and also considering the the quick quick developments of the um, uh, AI ecosystem and the AI technology. Uh, so at the moment, we are uh, uh, focusing on uh, the researchers uh, um, uh, that are working with SMEs or uh, other companies uh, in the industry side. Uh, we are um, collecting uh, their needs, but then the, the, the platform is uh, evolving, as Martin was uh, uh, mentioning earlier, and we are looking at uh, those needs that are coming now uh, with the uh, development in the generative uh, AI um, area and uh, discussing how we can implement that maybe with the uh, sister project uh, that has starting the deploy AI project. Thank you. Um, we have a question for you, uh, Martin, if you could uh, help us to elaborate on how the community can start engage 
with the um, start engaging or uh, developing their own services on the uh, platform. Yes, sure. So I already also provided a link to the resource that I'm going to show. And if you visit the Aon Demand website, you can see here the link uh, called Integrate. And in Integrate, you will find a couple of useful links that will show you how you actually can integrate with the, with the Aon Demand platform as a service developer. So this is the first bullet point. And you will find here a series of YouTube videos recorded by our colleagues from Einhoven. Then you will find the description of the metadata catalog, which is basically the thing that is currently behind the REST API, mostly. Also, you will find the link to the on demand open API. So what you can see here is something like this. And this is the documentation of the production version of the API, and you can play with that. So for instance, if you want to see the platforms that are available in the platform, in, in the AI on demand platform, you can click on this particular link, click try it, and you can run execute. You will not only see the results, and you can see that quite some platforms are already in, integrated, but you can also see the request URL, which can be used then in your code. So we can play with this, and you can yeah, play with, uh, with different requests. And also, what is interesting for the coders is this link, OpenAPI JSON. It can be used by different code generators to generate for you boilerplate codes, for instance, for platforms. So it will generate you some classes. It will generate you some interfaces in different codes, in Python, in JavaScript, in TypeScript. So this is more or less the entry point. And of course, there is also a link to A on demand GitHub. So we can find all the codes there. Martin, we have a question from Patrick and then Mikhail later. So uh, I don't need to read. You can access the, the, the question, right? Yes. OK. You go with Patrick then, please. So. Uh, I'm not quite sure if I got the question. OK, um, so I'm going to read it. Is the uh, segmentation AI aware or AI unaware much too simplistic given the fast paced evaluation of the market with general uh, AI, for instance? So you can answer it or we can take it up live because we don't really have much time. But if you can't uh, try, please go ahead. It's, so first of all, I'm not quite sure whether it's a question on me or rather Loredana. Yeah. yeah. I think, OK, uh, we can answer that a little bit later on. Uh, the second one is Martin mentions the decentralization of the AI on demand platform. Does it mean that each of the owner of the AI on demand instant is able to modify the catalog that they owned or is there a way to update or add access to the platform without owning an instance? Yes, this is a great question. Uh, it's a technical one. And the answer is basically yes. So if you have your own instance of the on demand platform, it is your own node, then you will be able to modify the catalog. Yes, because you have full control, the platform is open source. But the thing is also that the nodes are expected to synchronize with each other. So if you add some data to your node, based on the configuration that you select, some parts of the metadata will be synchronized with other nodes as well, which will provide some nice benefits. Uh, this synchronization is currently under development, if I'm not wrong. It, we are not far from uh, from it to operate, but it's not directly there. So, but, but yes, the, the aim is that you will have this possibility. And the, the other part of the question, yes, even if you do not own an instance of the on demand, you are definitely able to contribute your assets or your metadata 
So for instance, what can be done? And I think there is also one YouTube video in the links that I showed that shows you how you can add data from a new source that is currently not integrated with the platform to the platform. So there are multiple different options. You can either push the data through the REST API or you can implement so-called connector to a different data source. So basically the answer is yes. Thank you. So Patrick's question was for both. So I can try with Loredana uh, if you can uh, try, but if not, that's okay too. Yes. Is the segmentation AI aware or AI unaware much too simplistic given the fast paced evolution of the market with general AI, for instance? Yes, I was actually typing um, a response. Okay, go ahead, speak. Uh, so <laughs> indeed, uh, well, we have to take into account that the, the analysis was done uh, already at the be beginning of last year. So it's been a while when um, uh, Gen AI, let's say, is, it was not as evolved as today. Uh, so the, the results, uh, let's say, uh, showcase um, the needs at the time and uh, they have evolved indeed. Uh, it did include consideration regarded uh, linked to Gen AI, uh, so we did take that into account. But in, as we continue uh, working on the platform, these will be uh, analyzed maybe with more scrutiny uh, as, as as we go on. Martin, do you want to try that or you want to move on to the next technical question? Yeah, I would say... Go for the next technical question for now. Okay, I so Heli is asking, I was wondering whether you could elaborate a bit on how you see the overall relationship uh, of the AI on-demand platform uh, to the new Deploy AI EU projects. Uh, this one, uh, if you can try, but if not, I think that Bari will be uh, one of the uh, best leader of the projects to, to answer this. And uh, I think that we can um, get it uh, in connection uh, later on because eventually I would also follow up with you uh, after this um, seminar. But Martin, if you want to try. Yeah, so I can provide my view and the general view that is generally known. So the main goal, as I perceive it, is to build a common AI on demand platform. And we are setting the, the foundation stone of the platform as the AI for Europe project. And I hope that the deploy AI will either reuse or that we will collaborate on the same platform. Of course, there will be differences and there will be maybe big parts that will be developed in these two projects separately. I frankly do not know. Uh, okay. but, but there is there is one main difference or that the Air for Europe project, as I mentioned, is mostly focused on the researchers, both industrial and academic, but on the researchers. The deployed AI is more focused on the industrial part. Thank you. And uh, how do you account for the trustworthiness of the AI providers' solutions? Yes, so <laughs> this is an interesting question, and I, I don't think that we have definite answer. We, we are considering many options. First option is, of course, to automate. So let's suppose that we have roughly half a million of metadata about different AI assets. And we want to give some assurance or at least some estimate how trustworthy these assets are. And especially if the people will start to push new assets through the platform, we want to estimate their trustworthiness. So first of all, we could use, for instance, generative AI to estimate the trustworthiness based on the description of the asset and other related metadata. But we are also strongly considering the other option, and it is to use crowdsourcing. So let, for instance, the community vault or let the community to provide some systematic feedback on, on different assets in terms of their trustworthiness. So yes, we are thinking about it and we are also uh, not only considering, but already working on incorporating information from research papers in order to better estimate the trustworthiness of papers, but it's work in progress. 
Yeah, and that a little bit related to the uh, last question we have from Miguel is that uh, then there needs to be some authorization levels to modify the different assets and catalog. My uh, trial with its uh, with with the platform so far is yes. Uh, but again, there's some access as kind of open access is what we would try to to make the platform to be. But I let Martin to to answer this question. Yeah. So this is again a tough one, and I I don't think that we have right now the definite answer to this the authorization level. So when I mentioned that we have the authentication and authorization, what is currently mostly used is the authentication part. And the modification and especially the destruction of different assets is a question because it, it is closely related to the ownership of them, if nothing else. Thank so, you. Yes, I think that um, we, as I said, there is work in progress for the um, platform for the peoples uh, among us. So uh, we would want you to be a part of the conversation and see how you would like to contribute and be uh, with us. Um, and, and we appreciate your contribution in the coming weeks and months. So uh, the seminar is already five minutes over and we thank you for those who stays and we will this um, distributes the information about uh, what we have discovered this morning, but we also uh, wanted to have your feedback. So that's why in, our, in my email to you, as a follow-up, I'm going to um, include a feedback form there and we appreciate you to take time to send us your feedback. So thank you so much, Martin and Loredana for spending uh, the um, hours with us. And we appreciate the participation and active uh, participation in the question part of the um, participant as well. So we would like to thank you uh, for your participation today. And uh, hopefully that you will find our um, next uh, seminar by the end of May. Uh, and you, we want to see you there as well. So thank you. And I'm going to end our um, seminar today. Thank you. <laughs>